Hi, and welcome to Ivy English. I'm Karen, and I'm Chris Gorski. Today is October eighth, and please turn to page twenty-five in your magazines to learn about a very cute and interesting animal. Yeah, we're talking about the alpaca. Its fleece features and future, and it it just it's an animal that you just want to hug. That's right, and we've got some alliteration here. Fleece features. Future. We've got the F at the beginning repeated. We call that alliteration. Look it up if you don't know how to spell it. But I have to say something before we start that may color what we read. I have a former student who is a polyglot. You may have heard of him because he's written a bunch of books already. He's also online. He runs a polyglot cafe. If you want to join, if you want to learn languages, his name is Xie Zhixiang. His name is Terry Xie, and he heard me mention the word. Or the language Quechua, and Quechua is spoken in Ecuador and Peru and that surrounding area. So, I said someday maybe I'll learn Quechua, but I didn't get to it. So he went and learned it instead <laughs> first, which is great. It's sort of like your students pick up what you don't finish. And so he lived in Ecuador for a while, and he part of his language learning. A lot of people were in the classroom. He skipped the classroom, and he went to go herd the alpacas. And so, when we started talking about alpacas, he just made this face. He said, "I hate them." Really? Yes. He says they spit. Now, our article is going to say that alpacas are nicer than llamas because llamas can be pretty mean and they're known to spit. But let me tell you, alpacas do too. I suppose any. I, I, my wife and I often talk about this. That. For a long, long, long time, people often said that animals really didn't have any feelings other than hungry, angry. I want to poo poo pee pee. Maybe they'll be afraid. Who in the、and、world said that? This is this was like a common thing that people like. My wife and I are vegetarians, so we we both have very strong feelings about what animals think and feel. And an argument that we'll often hear about why it's okay to eat certain animals is they don't really have feelings, and and we just strongly disagree with that.、Um, and and I think that yeah, and many animals can be angry at you, and that doesn't mean like they hiss or they bite. They they can feel frustrated or annoyed, and they have these varied feelings. And I I think it's only natural that certain animals have their own way of expressing their displeasure. Spitting is one of them. <laughs> That's right. And it's funny that you mention that because I have always noticed that in my own culture since I was a kid, the Christian idea that only humans have a soul. I thought, what difference is there? Yeah, I, I have a hard、humans. time with that. Yeah. And then any, I think the only reason people say that is to justify treating animals cruelly, the, yeah, whether it's for meat or whether they're skins or whatever the reason, cap, keeping them in a zoo. Anybody who has interacted with any animal, even lizards. You know they have feelings,、oh, and、yeah. it's not just pain and other stuff. They have feelings, so yeah, you, you make a good point. They must be pretty angry if they're going to spit at you, but they do that. Let's go back to our title: the alpaca, its fleece, features, and future. So, alpaca. We're not allowed to speak Chinese, so you're going to have to go look it up if you don't know it. But it is an animal that looks like a llama, but it's smaller and. Basically, cuter and a little bit gentler that lives in the Andes in South America, and its fleece is the hair that grows on their bodies. And we also use that with sheep. The sheep that or the the hair that grows on the body of sheep we call their fleece. It's made into wool. And same with alpacas. Features means the special characteristics of something, and the future means. How they're going to develop into the future and in, into times to come. So the alpaca, its fleece features in future. Sometimes you'll see fleece as a verb to fleece somebody, and that means to rip them off to steal money from them. And that means to steal all their money. Yeah, he was fleeced. That means they took away, they cheated him of all his money to fleece somebody. Don't do that. Okay, and be careful that you are not fleeced. If somebody calls you from the phone company. Hang up immediately, because <laughs> they do not do their business in that way. Okay, so our title: the alpaca, its fleece features in future. First paragraph: the word domestication refers to the taming of wild animals for food, work, or pleasure. Cats and dogs, pigs and cows, horses and sheep, all once roamed freely, even before humans evolved. Later, these animals were raised by humans in controlled environments. Native to South America, the alpaca was a favorite animal raised by the Inca 
along with its cousin, the llama. The latter is a larger, hardier species used as a pack animal. The alpaca, smaller and lighter, was and still is raised for its fine, silky fleece. Both animals can survive in high altitude environments. The alpaca, in particular, can be found at altitudes of up to 5,000 meters, a kilometer higher than the peak of Taiwan's Mount Jade. People and animals living at such elevations must adapt to the thinner, oxygen poor atmosphere. This is why alpacas have far more red blood cells than other mammals. Standing only 90 centimeters at the shoulder and weighing no more than 65 kilograms, the alpaca is noticeably smaller than the llama. It is also friendlier to humans than its larger cousins, which are known to not only spit at each other in anger, but at humans as well. The alpaca rarely, if ever, spits at people. In such difficult terrain and climate, communication is very important for the alpacas. They are known to shriek when they find themselves in the face of danger. Males have a bird like scream when fighting. When relaxed, alpacas click or cluck at one another. They even hum when feeling comfortable and contented. Though wild alpacas are uncommon, domesticated ones number in the millions. Hopefully, the alpaca will be around well into the future. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay, we've already talked about the title. The word domestication refers to the taming of wild animals for food, work, or pleasure. Now, animals were originally all wild, but some of them somehow became used by or close to humans for various purposes, like the dog. Now, that's been going on so long. So, dogs have an interdependent relationship with humans. You know, they just kind of like are part of our world, and then dogs, you know, they're really here basically to interact with humans. And this is true of other animals as well. Now, domestic means having to do with a house. So, dom or domus originally meant home. Domestication means training something or breeding something so that it is suitable to keep in a home. Refers to means it is talking about, indicates the taming of wild animals. That means taking animals from the wild and then making them behave better or teaching them how to behave better so they can get along better with humans. Why did we use these animals for food? We ate them, like chickens and pigs and cows, for work, and then oxen would plow the field, for example. Horses, we ride horses. Or pleasure, riding horses can also be for pleasure. And then cats and dogs, we keep to make us happy. We keep them as pets. Just like Karen said earlier, domesticate is the Latin word for home. Now, the word tame is very close to the word domesticate, and it has a German origin. Which is the reason why we have two words in English that mean almost the same thing. Next sentence Cats and dogs, pigs and cows, horses and sheep, all once roamed freely, even before humans evolved. So they were here first, apparently. But then when humans came into being, they found that some of these animals could give humans, us humans, things that we needed. And so that's why we started domesticating them. So humans is a, an important word choice here. And I think that most people know this, but it's worth reminding that we wouldn't want to say the word people here because generally speaking, when we talk about people, we're talking about culture. People is a word better suited for social studies, but we're talking about the animal human here.、Um, so the better word in, because we're talking about science, evolution would be humans. Later, these animals were raised by humans in controlled environments, and that goes back to very, very early times. Yeah, when we talk about a controlled environment, that just means we're not letting things be wild. We're carefully setting places where they can live or what they can do. And so we're going to use the word controlled. Our next paragraph says Native to South America, the alpaca was a favorite animal raised by the Inca. Along with its cousin, the llama. Now, these should all be familiar to you. The Inca was an early people of around Peru, and they raised animals for various purposes. And one of them that they particularly liked, for reasons that will be clear in the next couple sentences, was or were the llama and the alpaca. The alpaca is basically a smaller kind of llama, or very similar to a llama. The word native has the N A T root, which in Latin means to be born. And you know this because of words like nature. 
So nature is where things can be born naturally, and so that N A T means to be born. And so I will remind you again that the noun is nature with an A. Nature. The adjective is natural with an A. Because I hear a lot of students say things like natural. It should be nature, natural. And there's another pair very similar. Nation is a country. National is the adjective form. That's the one I deal with a lot. A lot, yeah. Nature, natural, nation, national. Please remember that. Our next sentence says the latter is a larger, hardier species used as a pack animal. Now there's a lot of stuff in here to pay attention to. First of all, pack. You know from package things that we want to carry our belongings. We'll put them in a pack instead of carrying them ourselves. We can put them on the back of an animal. If an animal can help us carry our stuff, that is called a pack animal. And larger is no problem, but hardier, that is the comparative form for hardy, h a r d y, and it is related to hard, something that is very hard and sturdy. Hardier means that they are pretty strong and they don't die or get sick so easily. I think sometimes it's really fun to type in a word in like Google Image Search and see what appears. Oh, and if you wait, in... stop right there because that's so important. Whenever you see a new word, especially a noun, just go to Google Images and that will tell you what Westerners, English speakers, think of when we see that word. This is exactly what yes. I tell, especially my older students, because yeah. remember these are Westerners. If you search it in English, it's going to be Western English native speakers uploading these pictures. You're going to get the best idea of what people from that culture think what this means. And so, if you type in something like "hardy person," you're probably going to see like a larger, stronger man. He's not going to be thin. He's probably not going to be wearing a suit. Maybe you'll see someone doing like construction or building a house. Now, this is also a great point where we can look at right next to the word "hardy." And circle the letter S in species. There's it. We don't have a singular species. We always need to keep this as a plural form. That's right. And there's another point worth paying attention to, and that is the word hardy, H A R D Y, which means that you're very strong and not weak. You know, you can stand up to、mm, cold or extreme weather. We have a word that sounds about the same in American English, different in British English, and that's hardy. And hardy means very substantial. For example. In the cold weather we were talking about, we will like to have often like to have a hearty soup. That means that it's got a lot of calories in it. There's a lot of stuff in it, like lots of beans and meat and things. Yeah, something you probably would want a hearty meal in the winter. Think about the kind of food you want to eat, like in summer.、Um, I know we're not、cucumbers. supposed to use yeah, exactly cucumbers, watermelon,、uh, cold noodles. Yeah, those are not hearty foods. That's right. So hardier comes from h a r d y. Hearty, though we say hearty in American, and the comparative form is still heartier. They sound the same in British. You can distinguish them: hardy and haughty. So you will hear the difference in British, but not in American much. Our next, next sentence says:、mm-hmm. "The alpaca, smaller and lighter, was and still is raised for its fine, silky fleece." All right, now we're getting down to why the people. The early peoples of South America liked the alpaca so much. It's smaller and lighter, and we're going to find out another reason in the next sentence. But it grows this wonderful long hair, and humans can make this into things like blankets and scarves and things. So, if you ever go to a place like Peru, they sell a lot of beautiful woven goods made from alpaca wool. Both animals can survive in high altitude environments. Now that's another really, really important reason why they like the alpaca so much. Because you've got the Andes Mountains, which are very, very high. I personally have an experience with a high altitude environment because I visited Tibet once, and you really, really have to take precautions. A lot of people had to take altitude sickness medicine, like maybe half a day before they were going to go go to Tibet or go to a higher place. And you had to be careful not to run. You cannot even walk too fast because you will soon be out of breath. You might faint because you won't have enough blood and oxygen going to your brain. So, living, surviving, even visiting an, an environment that's at a very high altitude is very, very difficult. But this animal has adapted to it well. Let's continue. The alpaca, in particular, can be found at altitudes of up to five thousand meters, a kilometer higher. Than the peak of Taiwan's Mount Jade. All right, this reminds me again of my trip to Tibet. We did go to places that were especially high, 
And I think the highest altitude that we went to was over 4,000 meters. So that was still not as high as this. And I've it never was... been really high. I, I imagine that must be an interesting <laughs> feeling. Like I, not... Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe in some ways, but not in others. <laughs> We're laughing about something that's unfortunately very American. To get high <laughs> means to be on a drug and then kind of be on a trip. That's another kind of getting high. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about going up into a very high mountain. I suspect that's a very unusual feeling to be suddenly, to feel incredibly unfit and unhealthy where you can't even walk quickly. Um, It's true, but because we were given so many warnings and we were told to be really careful, it didn't seem to bother me that much. So when we went to that one place with a really high altitude over 4,000 meters, um, some people were having trouble getting lightheaded and things. I, I think I was fine. What really bothered me is because the air is so thin, it doesn't hold water. It was so right. dry. I yeah. could not take the dryness. The altitude, I think, was okay because I was careful. And, and that's interesting coming from cold places, too, because we're used to very dry air. So to to be that dry where it's almost to the point that you can't stand it, that that's really dry. It was nearly unbearable. That's right. In Minnesota, we our skin cracks and things. Yeah, it's very dry. But When the air is so thin, you really have to live with the dryness in addition to the altitude. Our next sentence says, People and animals living at such elevations must adapt to the thinner, oxygen-poor atmosphere. So this is just repeating what we said, that if you are in such a place, you are going to have to find ways to adapt. And over time, your physiology may change. Or people who can't take it, they will either die or they'll have to move somewhere else. So... If you are there, you're going to have to find a way to adapt or you just cannot prosper or live. I like in this paragraph, we have these three interesting words about kind of the gases and heights of the world. We have altitude, how high you are, your elevation, and then the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is the gas bubble around the earth. And we don't think much about the air around us. Sometimes we'll complain if it's kind of polluted. But we cannot live without air. And as soon as the air is not as full as it usually is, man, you're going to notice it and you're really going to appreciate air. And our next sentence here, it says, this is why alpacas have far more red blood cells than other mammals. So over time, that is how they evolved. Evolution helped them adapt so that they could do well in that environment. Next paragraph, standing only 90 centimeters at the shoulder. And weighing no more than 65 kilograms, the alpaca is noticeably smaller than the llama. So they're comparing the alpaca now to a similar animal, the llama, which is more like a camel. It's a South American camel. And telling you what's different about it. It's smaller in size. Next sentence. It is also friendlier to humans than its larger cousins, which are known to not only spit at each other in anger, but at humans as well. But as I said at the beginning, alpacas also spit. To, to be fair, when I'm angry, I spit at people, too. Really? No, no I'm, joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Little kids, I can imagine. When I, when I talk, I spit a lot. Um, that is... This, is... this is a time where we're always wearing masks. <laughs> but if you're in the front two rows of, like, my classroom, there's a good chance um, there's some spit coming your way eventually. <laughs> I, feel, I always feel bad about it, but I can't help it. That's going to happen. It's inevitable. We went to a presentation by a drama company, and they told you, now, we're here performing. There is going to be spit flying. That's just part of it. You have to push that voice out. Yeah, and I had to warn my students as well. Okay. Um, Next sentence. The alpaca rarely, if ever, spits at people. Now, I contest that. Go to YouTube, and then you will see people who have gotten spit at by alpacas. Just very quickly, while we're talking about kind of special features, one thing that I I was really interested in is um, how sure-footed the alpaca and the llama are. And and it's kind of like, yeah, we know they can stand well on mountains, but the reason why is actually pretty similar to the way our own feet work. And so we know when we're walking in the mountains, if some ground feels a little bit soft and it doesn't feel really stable, we can feel that in our own feet through our shoes, and we rarely, if ever, walk barefoot outside. Now, llamas and alpacas have especially sensitive feet. So when they're climbing very steep mountains and they're at a very sharp angle, their feet are even better at feeling that ground out than like ours, which are not even specially designed for that. And I just think that's a really interesting way to be able to feel through your body if this ground is safe to walk on or not. And that certainly has been crucial to their survival and prospering. Our next paragraph begins, in such a difficult terrain and climate, communication is very important for the alpacas. 
Now, we as humans are really big on communication. That's one of the most basic things about humans is communicating with each other. But it's not just humans. It's also important for alpacas and certainly many other animals as well. They are known to shriek when they find themselves in the face of danger. And many animals will do that. A shriek is a high, loud yell. Scream, our, yeah. Our next sentence is, males have a bird-like scream when fighting. Also not surprising. You know, you're in a fight, you're going to make some sounds. When relaxed, alpacas click or cluck at one another. Okay, you can go to YouTube and you'll hear all of these sounds, how they sound. Uh, when they are making all these different sounds. They even hum when feeling comfortable and contented. Also available on YouTube. Our last paragraph, it's very short. The wild alpacas are uncommon. Domesticated ones number in the millions. So there are lots and lots and lots of alpacas. That means that they are very, very important economically for many people of South America. Hopefully, the alpaca will be around well into the future. Now, we hope a lot of things will be around in the future. Why do we have to say that? It's because we humans are destroying so many things. Yeah, we're, we're good at killing. All right, we won't get uh, go down that rabbit hole. And by the way, to go down a rabbit hole, that means to get sidetracked and then go into too much detail about something that's not your main point. So let's go straight to our questions. Number one, why are cats and dogs mentioned in the passage? A, to give an example of how a wild animal became tamed. I think that's the right answer. I agree. So it's the right answer, but let's just quickly read the other ones. B, to compare the popularity of several wild animals. No? C, to introduce some species that were native to South America. Not the main point. D, to demonstrate the ongoing evolution of some common animals. No. Also not. Okay, so let's go to two. What can be inferred from the second paragraph? A, the llama and alpaca run faster than other animals. Doesn't say anything about that. B, no animals can survive at altitudes above 5,000 meters. The ones we're talking about can. That's wrong. C, red blood cells supply oxygen to all parts of the body. And that's, that's correct. the correct answer. It's letter C. And letter D, Taiwan's Mount Jade used to be home to llamas and alpacas. Says nothing about that. It does mention Mount Jade only to say that the altitudes that you'll find in South America, where you also find alpacas, are even higher than Taiwan's Mount Jade, which is our highest mountain here. Number three, which of the following information cannot be found in the passage? A, a behavioral difference between the llamas and the alpaca. Actually, they did mention that. Llamas spit more. B, the purpose of raising llama and alpaca. It does mention that as well, so that's not the right answer. C, the height and weight of the alpaca. Also mentioned because the alpacas are only about 90 centimeters to the shoulder and they weigh about 65 kilograms. So that's kind of comparable to a kind of hefty man, somewhat hefty. And D? The average lifespan of the alpaca. Yeah, it does not mention that. We don't know how long they live. Okay, so D is the correct answer. Our last question for today. For which of the following statements about the animals fit in section A of the diagram? Now, next we have two circles, and don't we call this a Venn diagram? V-E-N-N? -N? That's, That's a correct. Venn diagram. That means it lists a bunch of things that have some things in common, but other things that are they don't have in common. So it's got A with the alpaca, C with the llama, and they overlap at B. So we want to know which of the following statements about the animals fit in section A. That means they apply only to the alpaca and not to the llama, and not to things they share. Letter A. They're raised for carrying passengers and goods. That applies to both the alpaca and llama, so that belongs in B. Not correct. B. Their wool is valuable and used to make fabrics. Now that, they only mentioned the alpaca, so that is the correct answer. C. They click and spit when they feel tense. Now, as I mentioned, I think they both do that, but that isn't what the article says. D. D. They originate from South America. That applies to both, so it's not A. And finally, E, millions of them live in groups in the wild, and that is not true. They're mainly domesticated. So the answer is B, which includes B and D. Those are correct. And that is it for today. Please tune in next time. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.